Welcome to the latest in our series of anti-tank chats. This time we're going to be talking about a British Army Cold War anti-tank guarded weapons system. Swing fire. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. We are filming here in the VCC, the Tank Museum's Vehicle Conservation Centre, and I'd like to talk about some of the vehicles that mounted Swing Farm. But first, a little bit of background. As you're probably all aware, Germany was at the forefront of research into rocketry in the World War II period, and the Ruhrstahl X7 Rotkapchen, Little Red Riding Hood, was designed by the German rocket engineer Max Otto Kramer. This had a wirelink control system and a 2.5 kilogram warhead. With a speed of 360 kilometers an hour and a range of 1.2 kilometers, um, a few hundred were produced in the latter stages of the war. And anecdotal evidence suggests they were quite effective, even against uh, things like the Joseph Stalin heavy tank. First wire-guided anti-tank missile accepted into service with the British Army was the Malkara, a joint British-Australian weapons system developed between 1954 and 58. Malkara was originally designed to be man portable, but these things are, they, I mean, they weigh 93 and a half uh, kilograms and they're almost two meters long. So they're impractical for that purpose. Uh, they end up vehicle mounted, as you can see here on the Humber Hornet, but this vehicle is still designed to be air portable. Malkara entered service in 1958. It was never, uh, to be honest, really very successful. Uh, to begin with, as you can see behind me, the missile had to be raised into line of sight before firing, and that makes the launch vehicle visible. It left a smoke trail that indicated where the launcher was positioned, and it also had a tendency to veer from right to left, which meant the operator had to make very frequent course corrections. Another experimental system, Orange William, was uh, designed by Fairy Engineering. Now this was very experimental. It aimed to separate the launcher and the control vehicle by up to two kilometers. Unfortunately, it didn't work very well because the infrared guidance system was interfered with by rain, by fog, even bright sunlight. So the experiment was binned before it reached the production stage. Following the British Army's disappointment with Malkara, Vickers Armstrong's began development of another system, the Vigilant an acronym of Visually Guided Infantry Light Anti-Tank Missile. At less than a third of the weight of Malkara, Vigilant was man-portable, but it was also, as you can see here, mounted on the Ferret 26 armoured car with a launcher either side of the turret. A gyroscopic velocity control guidance system kept the missile level for flying directly away from the launch container while the operator controlled the missile via fins on the wing edges. Vigilant reached its maximum range of 1,375 metres in 12.5 seconds and developed a reputation for accuracy and ease of control. With a massive expansion in Warsaw Pact armour numbers in the 1960s, the British Army realised it needed a heavier, longer-range weapon to erode the huge numerical superiority of the enemy early. Malkara, with its four kilometre range, um, as we said, would have done the job. But, as we also said, it came with a number of problems. Vigilant was a very good infantry anti-tank system, but it hadn't got the necessary range. An American system, the BGM-71 tow missile, was offered as a possibility, uh, but it had the disadvantage the tracker had to be in line of sight of the target throughout the whole of the missile's flight and that made firing from cover just about impossible. To fulfil the requirements for range and an ability to fire from cover, the Royal Armament Research and Development Establishment, RADI, produced a specification titled Project 12. This was jointly developed between Ferry Engineering, British Aerospace and Wallop Engineering. The result was swing fire. Entering service in 1969, swing fire was a wire-guided anti-tank missile with a heat warhead and a range from 150 to 4,000 metres. First we'll look at the missile itself, then the vehicles equipped with it. The FV-438, 
the FV-102 Striker, part of the CVRT range, and the Mark V Ferret Scout car. The Swingfire missile is 1.07 metres long and weighs 27 kilograms. It comes in a hermetically sealed transport container with a control wire spool and electrical connection that slots into a launch bin on the vehicle. As you can see, the nose cone of the missile itself is hollow. Uh, there's nothing in it except a copper crush contact switch. And when it hits the target, that completes the circuit to set off the detonator below the charge. Now this is what we call heat, high explosive anti-tank. And I think a lot of people, it's a bit of a misnomer, they think it actually burns its way through. It doesn't. It's a kinetic energy weapon. Because what happens, this is a hollow point charge, a shaped charge, as it's known. The charge itself detonates and it collapses this cone and it punches those metallic f uh, particles forward uh, onto the armour and they in turn punch their way through the armour plate. It is quite effective. This will penetrate up to 800 millimetres of rolled homogeneous armour. Behind the warhead is the guidance system down here and just in front of that there is a two-stage rocket motor. Now the first stage takes the missile out of the container and it accelerates it to 648 kilometres per hour. Burns for six seconds. That then cuts out. The second stage motor fires and that's the point where the missile arms itself. On the booster motor burnout, the sustainer motor kicks in and that carries the missile onto the target, uh, which is up to 4,000 metres. That will take between about 24 and 28 seconds. There were some initial problems with excessive smoke from the rocket motor, but those were overcome uh, with the installation of low smoke motors uh, in the early 1970s. The final component are the four fins. These are spring-loaded and they deploy on uh, the point where the missile leaves the container. The guidance system is gyroscopically controlled. In fact, here's the little gyro just in here. Um, and what happens is the missile will leap out of the container, but the guidance system will then gather the missile back onto the controller's line of sight. He will then use the joystick to send signals to the missile via the wire guidance system to take it onto the target. The controller uses a thumb joystick to steer the missile by vectoring the thrust. That's, there are little servo motors down in the tail and they adjust the angle of the missile's tailpipe in order to steer it. The huge advantage of vectored thrust is this missile can execute hard turns, including turning through almost 90 degrees on leaving the container. Now, if you imagine something like a, um, an urban warfare fighting in built up areas scenario, the controller can be sat in a building or a shell scrape and the missile vehicle itself can be round a corner in an alleyway or something like that and the missile will actually come out of the container and then turn onto the controller's line of sight. The initial guidance system, MCLOS, manual control to line of sight, was subsequently upgraded to SACLOS, semi-automatic control to line of sight. And what this involved was fitting the missile with uh, an infrared tracker. And from then on, the controller didn't actually need to steer the missile. All he had to do was to keep the sighting system pointed at the target. Other improvements to the guidance system included a Baron Stroud infrared spotting scope and a thermal imaging site designed by British Aerospace and that dramatically improves uh, the system's viability in low light and poor visibility. As a weapon system, swing fire proved remarkably accurate and in trials at the School of Tank Gunnery at Lulworth, not far from here, 80% of missiles fired successfully hit the target. Swingfire was vehicle mounted on two tracked platforms, the FV-438 and the FV-102 Striker, part of the CVRT range, and the Mark V Ferret Scout car. As well as the basic vehicle mount system, BAE also produced a pallet type launcher, B-Swing, for mounting on light vehicles such as Land Rover, and Golf Swing, a towed infantry launcher, also designed to be mounted on the Argocat amphibian. Hawkswing, a mounting system for the Lynx helicopter, 
never reached the operational deployment stage. FV-102 Striker is part of the CVRT range, uh, and that includes things like Scimitar and Scorpion. Um, it is a very fast and agile track platform. This vehicle, it's aluminium armor, it only weighs eight tons, and it's capable of over 80 kilometers an hour on the road. And that's very, very fast for something with tracks. It's got a crew of three, driver, commander, and controller. And over the back there are five missile bins. Uh, those are elevated by hydraulics operated from inside the vehicle itself. This particular example is a prototype and it's got an experimental wading screen and that wasn't carried on into the production model. At the back of the bins, there's a deflector plate and that limits the effect of blast when the missile is launched. On the very rare occasion when a hang fire has happened, what that means is the, uh, the motor's burning but the missile itself hasn't launched. It's burnt the back out of the bin. Um, fortunately, without burning its way through into the crew compartment. Although I do remember seeing one example where molten metal had welded this rear door shut. It's badged as a vehicle of L battery, Royal Horse Artillery. Stryker was operated by the Royal Artillery from when it entered service in 1976 until 1984 when it was transferred to the Royal Armoured Corps. The other tracked platform to mount Swingfire was this one. This is FV-438, and it's a member of the quite versatile FV-430 family, uh, which included FV-432, uh, the classic British armoured personnel carrier battle taxi of the Cold War period. FV-438 carried 14 Swingfire missiles, including two on the launcher, as opposed to only 10 for Stryker. But there's another significant advantage. Striker, the missile bins have to be reloaded from the outside. With 438, the process happens inside the vehicle. So here we are. This is the interior of FV438. This one was actually a prototype vehicle. It's a bit stripped out now, but the sense you do get is really quite a lot of space. If you think about it, the base FV430 uh, series was designed as an armored personnel carrier. So there's actually quite a lot of space in here, certainly a lot more than there is on Stryker. In terms of crew positions, right up the front there, you have got the driver's position uh, with his steering levers and other controls. Behind him is the commander. The commander, these guys have both got um, hatches of their own. The commander has got a cupola that mounts uh, a GPMG, a general purpose machine gun. The commander has also got the comms kit and that would be just down by his right elbow. This uh, object here, this is part of the NBC filter system. NBC is Nuclear Biological Chemical Warfare. You have to remember that this vehicle had to be designed to operate in hideously contaminated conditions. We're talking World War III here, potentially. The way it works is there's a filter so that any air coming into the vehicle goes through that, contaminants are removed, you can't airproof. You can't make a vehicle like this airtight. So it maintains an atmospheric pressure inside, which is about 2 psi above what you find outside. Uh, cutting to the chase on that, what that means is that uh, air will seep out of the vehicle, but nothing will actually get in. Moving further from that, you've then got the third crew member, the controller. And this is the actual missile controller apparatus up here and then the missile bins. Now, the advantage of this vehicle over Stryker is it can be reloaded from the inside. So what you do, there are two individual bins, you grab that handle, pull down, the bin drops down, and you slot a missile into it. Here we've got the ready racks, and there are six missile containers uh, filling up the majority of the interior. This is the missile controller, and it's a periscopic sight, uh, nicknamed ET from the shape of it from the outside. And then the controller's position is here. You've got two handles and the controller's job is to fire the missile and then keep the sight trained on the target vehicle. Over on this side, you've got a handle and then there is the actual fire button and applied safety. 
on this side there is a short joystick and what you do is you use that to steer the missile as we said earlier vectored thrust so looking through the site itself uh, there are no crosshairs or anything of that sort because you don't need them uh, what i'm looking at is the target vehicle straight in front of me when the missile is fired it will jump out of the container but then the guidance system will gather it into line of sight so what will happen is I'll see a little white dot, which is the tail flame of the missile heading for the target, which can be up to four kilometers away. And I will use this joystick to steer it in. There's a couple of other useful little features here. Uh, there is windscreen wiper and also a heater. Anybody who has experienced the North German plane in winter will know you're going to be using those quite a lot. Now, uh, Swingfire is quite a substantial missile, so the ready racks, and you've got space for nine missiles here, take up a fair bit of the interior of the vehicle. This is a launcher container, so the missiles come pre-packed in this, hermetically sealed. And on this side, there is uh, an electrical connection that plugs into the actual launcher bin. This is a fired missile uh, container, so we'll just have a quick look inside. You can see, as I said, electrical connection there. And then this is the command wire. So this is the end of what would have been 4,000 metres of very fine nylon-covered copper wire. I always thought of the future battlefield as being covered in a spider web of this stuff, thousands and thousands of miles of it. The last of the swing fire armed vehicles in our collection is this the Mark V Ferret Scout Car. Designed by Daimler after World War II, the Ferret replaced a number of light armoured vehicles, including its predecessor, the Dingo. With a monocoque construction giving a good degree of strength, excellent all-wheel drive off-road capability, and top speed of 80 kilometres an hour, the Ferret was an excellent recce vehicle. Ferret had the capacity to carry six swing fire missiles, uh, four in the launch bins and two spare. And what that makes this is a stealthy, nimble, fast little vehicle that packs a punch well above its weight. Like Stryker and FV438, Ferret had a remote launcher apparatus, which is this. Uh, this would be connected to the vehicle by a 100 metre cable, or in the case of Ferret, 50 metres, because there wasn't enough space in the vehicle to store it. But the good thing about this is the vehicle could actually stay hull down in cover and the operator could fire the missile from a remote location. In terms of deployment, from when Stryker was taken over by the Royal Armoured Corps in the mid-1980s, a long-range anti-tank guided weapons troop was part of each armoured regiment in the UK and the British Army of the Rhine, with nine FV-438s being part of an armoured battle group. In the British Army of the Rhine, each recce squadron had an LR-80 GW troop comprising four FV-102 strikers. In a likely NATO versus Warsaw Pact combat scenario, fought out on the North German plain and running into the urban and industrial areas of West Germany, Swingfire's long range, outraging a tank gun by at least a kilometre, and ability to be fired from cover would convey big advantages. And in fact, the manufacturer's promotional literature uh, states that in defence, vehicles mounting swing fire will engage enemy armour at long range, cover obstacles and gaps, counter penetration and provide flank protection. In withdrawal, swing fire platforms will provide long range delay, cover from intermediate positions and again fire, provide flank protection. And then when advancing or attacking, if it's all going right, uh, they could provide cover for forward movement and again protect the flanks. As a weapon system, Swing Fire has seen service with a number of countries in Europe and further abroad. The British Army retired Swing Fire in favour of the Javelin ATGW system in 2005. Javelin, used in Afghanistan and most recently and successfully against Russian armour in Ukraine, is massively more sophisticated than the swing fire, including fire and forget and a top attack facility, but doesn't equal swing fire's range. Two and a half kilometres 
uh, for javelin as opposed to four kilometers for swing fire. So there we have swing fire, very much a product of its time. And um, I know in terms of today's technology, wire guided sounds a bit sort of antique, archaic, um, but at that period, this was cutting edge technology. Would it have worked? Well, if it had come to the crunch, uh, if we had been fighting on the North German plane, I think it would have been a very effective weapon system. It's got a combination of long range, it hits hard, and you can fire it from cover. I think it would have made a substantial contribution.